those who are here, I appreciate it. We're going to start. Um, we talked right before we left, the very beginning of what I'm calling Lesson 3, uh, about the, the Wesleyan quadrilateral. It's just a uh, thing that got put together by John, John Wesley uh, on interpreting Scripture, kind of questioning the the old sola scriptura, or scripture alone, of the Reformation. Um, he said, well, I, I, he never said these words, but as I looked at it, I realized whether you say it or not, when you interpret scripture, you do use reason. I don't think it's bad to look back into church history to try to look, you know, what did early church fathers and early church people say? I mean, they're not always right. We're going to run across something today where... You know, the reason why the early church fathers, I believe, misinterpreted a book was for a particular reason that I think was wrong. But um, so obviously they're human just like we are, and they, so they'd be wrong. But to, to look to see what the early church, the people closest to when it happened, the thought that the scripture said is, uh, you know, is, is a good thing to do. As long as you don't ever get to the point where the Catholic, like the Catholic church is, where they say tradition and scripture are of equal value. <clears throat> and so... Tradition can usurp scripture in their minds. And, and the sad thing is, even if you try to make sure you keep it, the scriptures on top, we're just human. <laughs> we're fallen, we're finite, and at times we can let tradition usurp scripture, especially if we're trying to support our dogma. So anyway, I just thought it was something that had merit, and so we, uh, we talked about it. And now we're going to move on, um, mainly talk about context here in uh, lesson three. There's an old saying in real estate. You probably all heard it when you're trying to sell or buy a home. The question is, what are the three most important things? Everybody knows what the answer is, right? Location, location, and location are the three most important things. Well, I would maintain it close to true, or probably true, the three most important things when trying to interpret the Bible are context, context, and context. And we'll talk about that a little bit today. Um, we're going to talk about the importance of context here. And there are a number of contexts that are important, and we're going to briefly talk about many of them. I don't have a lot of information on a lot of them because there just wasn't time. We'll briefly talk about them. mainly going to spend time talking about uh, language context, word context, and literary context theological context and try to determine what a scripture means. So, we're talking here about various contexts in the Bi in Bible interpretation. The first one is geographic that I've got listed here. Um, geographic context. In Jonah, I don't know if I put this, see what I did. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh the great city, and cry against it, etc., etc., etc. And so he went down to Joppa because he didn't want to go, and he fled to Tarshish. Now, Nineveh was the main city in Assyria, several hundred miles northeast, northeast of Jerusalem. Uh, Joppa was a port city on the Mediterranean Sea, east of Jerusalem, and the location of Tarshish, while not exactly known, they believe that Tarshish was very far west from Joppa, across the Mediterranean, in Spain or in Asia Minor. The point is that Jonah fled just about as far west as he could get, away from where he was supposed to go. And so it, it's a minor little point, but just looking at the geographic context gets you a little more information on what Jonah was doing, and, and, and especially what he was not doing, and how hard he was trying to get away from what he was supposed to be doing. He was trying to get as far away as possible from Nineveh because he told God he didn't want to go there and preach to those heathens because, doggone it, they're probably going to repent and you're probably going to forgive them, and he didn't want that to happen. So that's just a, a minor point on geography, but it, most of the time when I'm reading through the Bible and I'm reading about all these geographic locations, I tend to just kind of blow by them. Um, and, and I'm not saying it's important all the time, but it's probably worth looking into at least. Now, as I've said before, there are many places, uh, uh, places from biblical times where the historians don't really know exactly where it was, but 
uh, have a general idea, and, and so there are going to be times when ge geography is going to help you maybe get another little extra point about what's going on in the scripture. So it's a good context to know. Uh, the historic context. Uh, simple example, Simon the Zealot and Matthew the tax collector were disciples of Jesus. From the history, zealots and tax collectors hated each other. That they could both be one of the twelve speaks, I believe, about the power of Jesus to break down barriers between people. They normally would not have been together in any endeavor anywhere, and yet they were of the chosen twelve and went to be with Jesus. And, and again, um, the history, obviously we're talking about a lot of things, history and culture and language and all these things that happened many thousands of years ago and things that we are immensely remo removed from and don't really know that much about. But, and, we're, and then we're trying to interpret a book that's written around all that stuff. And so these are the kinds of things that we should know. Um, cultural context is another one. Example, Passover celebrations, the Seder Supper, in Jewish culture can help enhance understanding of what the various gospel writers write about the Last Supper. It's just a, another, and we, we celebrated a Seder Supper here. I'm sad to say the one time we did it, I missed it because I happened to be on one of the few trips I take in the year to the Division II basketball tournament, and I was gone that, when we had it, so I was disappointed that I missed it. Uh, but it's just little things like this. Again, it's the culture that we don't understand. And, and this tends to mean that there are times when we will interpret things based on our culture that we understand. And especially the further back you go in the Bible, that's typically going to be wrong. It's going to be wrong all the time because our culture and their culture are so different. And the things that we understand in our culture were not, in general, uh, true in their culture. So we need to understand the, their culture. And even scientific things, uh, for example, Psalm 24, 1 and 2 says, The earth is the Lord's and all it contains, the world and those who dwell in it, for he has founded it upon the seas. It has, he has founded the earth upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. If you just read that straight out, you might think, gee, all of our continents are floating in the water. And, you know, this is one thing that we just know not to be true. So then you, you would, it would suggest to you, gee, and, and this is in Psalms, by the way, which happens to be one of the books in the scripture that is ex extremely figurative language everywhere. So it wouldn't be too hard of a stretch to say, gee, I bet the psalmist is using some figurative language here. And so rather than taking it as strictly literal here, you look into some of the types of, uh, types of uh, figurative or metaphorical language. Uh, Revelation 7, 1, after I saw this, four angels were standing at the four corners of the earth. Well, our earth is a sphere, and spheres don't have corners. And, and this is one thing that, you know, unbelievers or people that are trying to mock the Bible will throw in your face. And they say, look at that. The Bible doesn't even know that the earth is round and it's not flat. Well, come on. The corners of the earth is another literary technique that we talked about, stretched out to all the ends of the earth kind of thing. And, and again, it's, it would be something that we look at and say, well... Um, certainly by the 4th century, they knew the earth was round. This would have been written before that, um, some, but still, yeah. Well, would you do me a favor and grab that microphone and say it in there? That'll, that'll help if you could. Just grab it. And if you want to keep uh, it down and fancy. pass it around, too. That sure. Would be I'd say there's actually a verse in Job that calls the earth a circle yeah. as well. Yeah. So it, um, we would look at this and say, well, clearly... The writer is using a literary technique to speak about something, you know, we're, we're talking about angels spread out across the earth, um, that kind of thing. So um, th these are just simple things, but, and, and it's more than just being able to argue with somebody who's trying to trip you up and throw this kind of stuff in your face. It, it comes down to, you know, interpretation, to be able to um, pretty definitively say, gee, pretty sure this is figurative language here, so let's figure out what he's really trying to say and the meaning of it. Okay. Now, the things that I've talked about here, things like uh, ge ge geographic things, um, you think about using a Bible atlas. Um, there are many different Bible atlases out there, and they do range in having been written by extremely liberal people to extremely conservative people. 
So if you're looking for a Bible atlas, it's a good thing to have. Um, I personally would look for one that's a little more conservative, although when it comes to geography, most people tend to agree whether they're liberal or conservative. Um, of course, atlases also not, don't just have maps. They usually have a lot of write-up, a lot of commentary on what's, what's going on around these places. So it essentially is a book that has a lot of maps, and it also has a lot of commentary on the scripture. So given that, I, I would look for one that was written by from a little more conservative viewpoint because um, that's what I agree with. So anyway. Um, and then histories, you know, there's lots of church histories out there. Obviously, there's tons of commentators that, that speak about history and different things. So there's ways to find out this information um, that, um, that we don't have right off the top of our head. Okay, word context. I want to talk about word context. And the word context actually comes from a Latin meaning together weaving. Makes sense. It's what is, what weaves together everything that we're looking at here. And when we're talking about word context, of course, we're talking about the weaving together of our written scripture, because that's what we're talking about here. Okay, we're going to look at, uh, uh, begin to look at words and, and rules about words and word studies. Uh, we got to be careful in our usage of English words in our translation. Technically, we are not reading the real Bible. We are reading a translation of the real Bible. The real Bible is written in Hebrew and Aramaic and Greek. And as we were talking yesterday in the introductory and in the Bible translations thing, um, once you start translating from one language to another, you have at least from a few to a lot of in of um, interpretation kinds of issues that the translators have to deal with because no one, no language will ever translate perfectly into another language. And so, but again, we read in English because that's what we read, unless you press two for Spanish, and then you read in Spanish, I guess. But um, uh, so we are, we got to be careful. If you read a scripture and there's an English, uh, an English word in there, and you think you know what it means based on the English, because that's what we speak. Uh, be careful about making too many, you know, doctrinal decisions based on the English word. Um, everybody should, I believe, have at least a Greek concordance. Not because we're experts at Greek, but because it helps us look up the possible meanings of the Greek word. Because that's or Greek or Hebrew, whatever you're reading. Because that's what we're, we should be basing the meaning of the text on, is what does the original word mean? Uh, sometimes the translation words, you know, some versions do better than others in, in the translation. And, and as I said yesterday, it, it helps also to compare many translations. So I'm hereby relieving you of any guilt of having as many different versions of the Bible as you can. If you can afford them and have them, I think they're good to have because they help you in the whole interpretation scheme, especially in more difficult scriptures where you will find translations that can be quite a bit different between the versions. And if you see that, it will sort of clue you in that, boy, here's a scripture where there was some translation difficulty. It wasn't an easy verse to translate, and different translators had different interpretations. It gives you a little better idea. And then just having a concordance. You look up the English, and it points you to the to the Greek or the Hebrew that we, uh, was translated from and gives you all the possible meanings, and then you can be looking at the context. Well, we'll talk more about that in a minute. So having a concordance, I think, is a good idea. Um, okay, we're going to look at some uh, rules here about word context. And I, I've probably said some of these things in various messages I've made in the, uh, in the chapel. If you've heard it before, you know, try not to suffer too much. Word context. A word's meaning is determined by its usage, usage in context. And I've said this many times. A word by itself in a vacuum has no meaning. A word by itself in a vacuum has usually lots of possible meanings. We'll talk about that in the next one. But the people who write dictionaries determine what the possible meanings are by going and finding the usages of the words in context to say, you know, who's using these words and for what reason? And that's how they come up with all the various meanings that are possible in the dictionary. Um, and so there's many possible meanings for a word. Uh, word oh, there, I should have had that up there because I just said all that. Uh, the next
next thing, words have a semantic range, and that's just a fancy way of saying most words that in, our, in English that we look up in the dictionary have many possible meanings. Which meaning is intended is only determined when the word is actually used. And I've used this example many times in here, but let me say it one more time. The word trunk has many different meanings. It can mean that, you know, the long nose that sticks off the front of an elephant. It can mean a box that you stick in your, in your closet to store things in. It can mean um, a, something on the front or the back, most of the time in the back of your car that you open up to throw things in. Uh, it can mean a kind of a highway that typically connects major cities, a trunk highway, and there's probably many other meaning, possible meanings that I'm not thinking of right now. But if I said to you, I went to the grocery store and I took the groceries out and put them in the trunk, I probably didn't stuff them in an elephant's nose. Okay? I mean, pretty clear from context what I'm talking about there. That's what I mean by context. Context defines the meaning of the word. So Hebrew and Greek words, of course, have the same thing. They have a broad semantic range. So when studying a Bible text, we have to determine which one or a few, because many times the few listed ones in the concordance are very similar. So it could be you know one or a couple of the meanings. But if there's seven or eight different meanings, it doesn't mean all of those things in any, in any verse. Um, the, the original writer had a meaning in mind when he used the word, and it was probably one or a couple of the meanings that are listed in there, and it's our job to try to figure out, based on the whole context around what's going on, which meaning the original author intended. And again, it's harder when you don't know the original language, but again, using tools like concordances and multiple Bible versions and even commentaries and things can help you understand what the word possibly means. Now, you get Bible lexicons, which are basically Bible dictionaries for Greek or Hebrew. There's a whole bunch of them. Um, and the, the, whoever's writing that, their theology will come through in there too. I have one called uh, Thayer's Bible Dictionary. He does just the New Testament. And I never, I'm a man, I never read the introduction or the beginning or anything, any books I ever get. I just turn to the beginning. Of course, at a Bible dictionary, I just turn to whatever word I'm looking up. I don't read all that stuff to be any of these things. So I finally sat down one time after I'd had it for years and read the introduction and found out this Thayer guy was a Unitarian Universalist. He, he was an expert at Greek, but now all of a sudden you're saying, gee, uh, you know, Unitarian Universalists are humanists. Uh, they tend to deny Christ and deny the scriptures. So then I started thinking, gee, the guy's doing a Greek lexicon of the Bible. Imagine what kind, you know, you got to be careful then uh, when you're looking up words in there to, because his theology, which is drastically liberal and left-wing, is going to come out in places. Now, I've compared it to other lexicons that I have, and in general, he does a pretty good job, but it's something to know, and I don't use it as much now anymore as the other ones that I've got. Uh, but uh, Strong's has always been a good one. If you have, I know Strong's was originally done for the King James. I know they did it. They changed the version and did it for the New American Standard. Do they have one for NIV? Do you know? Online. Online, okay. So it, it, it's going to go with whatever version that you have, but if you can find it, um, it, it helps. Because it'll tell you when you look at, when you look up the English word and then you go to the Greek, the Greek will tell you all the different English words that it was translated into, because it's you know every Greek word isn't translated into just one English word. It's translated into a bunch of different English words, depending upon what the uh, what its possible meanings are, and depending upon what the author was trying to say. And then you can look up all those other verses too. So when you're trying to find out the meaning of a word, and you start, well, how else was this used by either the same author in the same book, preferably if you can find that, if there is one, or the same author in a different book, or if it's New Testament, other authors in the New Testament, we'll talk about that in a minute, but uh, you want to see how else it was used, and Strong's helps you find that. Okay, another thing that I've mentioned, hello, there we go. A word does not mean all of its semantic range in any given occurrence, and it, you can't pick which one you like, um, and, and that can be a problem. 
you go and start looking it up, and since we don't know the language, you say, oh, this word can mean this or this or this or this or this. Oh, gee, that one, that fits in really well here with my dogma. So I think I'll pick that one. No, that's not how we do it. You pick it out based on the context and try to figure out what it means. And um, this is why, this is the problem with the Amplified Bible. I've said this before. The only Bible I've ever thrown away except ones that were wrecked. As soon as I found out, the Amplified Bible is a Bible that used for keywords. The whole Bible is written, and then keywords in each verse, it lists the English word, and then behind it in parentheses, it lists all the possible uh, Greek words that could have been used there. And, and if you're not paying attention, you sort of get the implication, well, it could be any one of these Greek words here, or any one of these meanings. And all they're, all they're doing is listing the semantic range of what it got translated from, but it can't be all those. So why would you put all of them next to the word in every verse? You're like, what a dumb thing to do. It could lead me astray. So as soon as I found that out, I went home, took the Bible, and I threw it away. I'm not ever going to use that one again, because that's a really dumb idea. So I don't normally, well, yeah, I probably do tell people what to do, even though they never listen to me. But if you have an amplified Bible, I'd throw it away. I wouldn't use it. Um, Okay, there are no exact synonyms. Everybody knows what a synonym is, two words that mean um, almost exactly or close to the same thing. But there is no such thing as exact synonyms. For example, strong and powerful are considered synonyms. And we could say that a wind is strong or powerful, but we don't usually say that the coffee is powerful. Sometimes people may say that, but most of the time we say that's really strong coffee. We wouldn't say powerful coffee. So again, depending upon the context, we might use one of those words, but not both. And in some contexts, you might use either one, and, and it wouldn't matter. Another example, the words begin, start, and commence are synonyms. We can begin or start or commence our day, which we did just a few minutes ago. But we don't usually begin or commence our car. We only start the car. So again, this is English examples, but I'm saying all along the English examples we understand. But the same thing is true in Greek and Hebrew. There are synonyms that are used in different places, but they, they don't always, you know, there's a little bit of, there's overlap in synonyms, but there's some that doesn't overlap. And so that just puts another little extra bit of difficulty when you find out uh, words that have possibly the same meaning that are used in different places and you're trying to compare. You've got to figure out, again, from the context, which meaning is meant in each one, and it might not be the same, even though they are basically synonyms, but in the particular context, they might not be. Um, so there are no exact synonyms. Uh, words change meanings over time. Gay used to mean happy. <laughs> Guess I don't need to say too much more about that. A nice originated from French and originally meant ignorant. So be careful if somebody calls you nice. After this class, just be careful. Okay, nice and ignorant, pretty different meanings. And we went through some of the changes in the meanings yesterday from the, that the King James used, where quit you in want, in fact, in 1611 meant be that. It said quit you, but it meant be that. Um, I think it was. 1 Corinthians 1611 said, quit you like men. And it meant be a man, stand up and be a man. But nowadays we read quit and it tells you to quit being that. Um, and, and so, you know, you got to be careful. Uh, sometimes the meanings are exactly opposite or very kind of opposite. Nice and ignorant are, well, not exactly opposites, but they're certainly not the same. Okay, now this, again, this is the, a list of the most to the least important ways to try to determine the meaning of a New Testament Greek word. Let me just list them. The first one is from the New Testament author himself. So if you're, find, if you're looking at a word in a New Testament book, you want to find out how does this author use that word elsewhere, especially in the same book that I'm reading. The tendency is um, that it will be the meanings, it will in general be the same. And some of the context might be easier to figure out. So that it doesn't necessarily have to be exactly the same all the time, but at least it gives you a clue that it may be the same because he's using the same word in the same book, same person. It wouldn't be as uncommon for him to use the same word for the same meaning. So that's the first place you go, if you can find some, obviously. The next one would be from the New Testament in general. How did some of the other writers of the New Testament 
who were writing in and around the same time that the author was writing the book you're reading, how did they use the word? So that's just another way. That's, that would be the second best way to do it. The third one would be from how it was used in the Septuagint. The Septuagint, or the LXX they call it, is the Greek version of the Old Testament that was used back. Uh, most of the quotes that come in the scripture in the New Testament are out of the Septuagint version. Now, this is a little bit, well, I hope there's better versions than the one I have. The one I have is just straight Greek. That's all it is. Um, I am not a Greek expert. I have looked into Greek enough to know the alphabet and to be able to pronounce words so I can kind of find words in there when I'm looking at verses and, 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 uh, or look at a verse and then find out. I don't read it well, and it's hard based on just word order and all this kind of stuff to figure out. If it's not the same word I'm looking for, what, which word is exactly the word? But at least it narrows it down to which ones to look up in Strong's or somewhere to figure out what they mean. So you can try to find out. Um, in, 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 in the same English word that was translated into the Old Testament, in a place where it looks like the same kind of usage, you might want to find out what word was used there. Uh, it may be either the same one you're looking at in the New Testament or uh, almost synonym or so that would be like third best if you can again you can find I just found a Septuagint online and ordered it okay from the Hellenistic Greek from the 200s BC to the 200s AD or so and how the church fathers used the word okay now we're getting into things where you're gonna have to have some real tools you know history uh, different old histories that talk about this um, and what words they used uh, I did years ago buy the whole set of all the old uh, church fathers, anti-Nicene, post-Nicene fathers, a million books. And they're really hard to, they're hard to read and they're hard to dig through to figure out when you're trying to find what a particular church father said about something. But at least it's there. So if you can take it out and not fall asleep before you're done, uh, you can sometimes find some help in there and how they use the words and things. Um, and again, and other tools, I, I, I don't know. I haven't even looked too much. Uh, I really only have probably the church father history type stuff, so I don't know that I've gotten a whole lot to help here, but this would be another way to do it. And then the last one is classical Greek and the etymology. Etymology means the origin of a word, or the origin of something. In this case, we're talking about words. Classical Greek isn't very good because the, the, the New Testament was written in what's called Koine Greek, which was a common Greek. And the classical Greek was, you know, a couple hundred years before the Koine Greek. And so there's quite a few differences. So this is why it's listed at the, towards the bottom. And again, you'd have to have some tools like histories or some things that I don't have um, to look up this kind of stuff. But I'm just saying that this is, uh, um, this is the kinds of things that you would do. Hopefully you would start at the top and be able to find them. Now, there are numerous... Uh, there are numerous words that are used in the Bible once. So those are harder <laughs> because they're used only once. So then you have to look away from the Bible immediately if you're trying to find anybody who uses the word. And so then you got to start looking into some of these older histories. Um, I mentioned earlier yesterday that there are some other languages around the time, like uh, Akkadian and Ugaritic and some of these other things I never even heard of before, that are somewhat similar to Greek, and they tend to have cognates. Cognates are words that are very similar. Um, they almost read similarly, and they have similar meanings. And so, again, you'd have to have tools to look that stuff up. I don't even do that well in English, so Ugaritic is not on my list. Um, but you'd have to have special tools that would help you there to find out if they have any cognates. So if you run across words that are only used once, you know, it gets much harder, and you have to find some much more difficult areas where you hopefully find an expert that knows that stuff. Okay, here's an example of a bad sermon from bad linguistics. Okay, I'm gonna, this is in English uh, because we don't do Greek. I don't understand Greek, so I'm gonna do it in English. Suppose our text said, Jack be nimble, Jack be quick, Jack jump over the candlestick. This is our text that we're trying to exegete here and, and preach to the congregation. And so we get up and we say, in English, the word jump was used of starting cars in the winter. We certainly know what that means. 
So jumping requires the transmission of an electric current. So in our text, Jack didn't just jump over the candlestick. This text implies something electric about his jumping. OK, that's a lousy sermon based on lousy linguistics. OK, the example is silly, and I did it in English. But we do this all the time in Greek, and it's much more likely, or Hebrew, it's much more likely for us to do it there because we don't know the language. Okay, there shouldn't be any excuse to do something like this in English, but the point is we found a possible meaning for the word jump and then applied it to our verse and probably made a logical conclusion if that was the meaning that was supposed to be there, but it's clearly not. And so it's, it's, it's bad. This is bad interpretation. This is bad preaching. And this is the kind of stuff, like I said, that we do at times in Greek and Hebrew because we don't know the language and we're trying as hard as we can to find the word. But I know in the past, and, and hopefully this has been a long time ago and I haven't done it recently, I'm not sure. I'm not gonna say that, I'm not gonna say that I haven't, but I hopefully haven't. I've did what I mentioned before. I found words that and looked at the meaning and say, oh, hey, I like this meaning. <laughs> this meaning fits well in here with what I already believe, so I think I'll pick this one. Uh, and that was, you know, more early on in trying to dig into the Greek. And then you start having people teach you that, oh, that's not how you do it. You're supposed to find the real meaning that the guy meant. <laughs> Who'd have thought? Um, and, and so that's, again, it's a thing that we do. Okay. Now let's move on from the word context to the literary and theological context. And the first thing I'm going to do, if this comes up, is to throw up a definition. This word is called pericope. Another $5 word, but it means a thought unit from Scripture that makes reasonable sense read by itself apart from its larger context. Um, in a gospel, a parable. Pick a parable out. It would be a, a chunk of text that you would pick out of the middle of somewhere, and it would make sense reading it by itself. Okay, so if I use the word pericope in some of these, that's what I'm talking about here. Okay, first question. Is it in the Old Testament or the New Testament? Well, if you're Al Gore, you probably don't know. And you probably tell people that your favorite New Testament book is Job, or something that he said years ago. Um, and and I, you know, I shouldn't mock people, but it clearly gave you the indication the guy doesn't read the Bible much. Because you know, my kids, when they were little, learned the Bible song. And they learned how to sing the books. And they knew which ones were in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It isn't that hard to learn. You spend a few minutes at it. But, um, finding, you know, so the Old Covenant has been done away with by the New Covenant, so some commands in the Old Covenant don't apply directly anymore. We talked about it a little bit. There'll be more on that coming. Uh, the issue of exactly which commands no longer apply to us isn't as easy as it first appears, but it certainly has to be established before the meaning of the text could be fully known. And the other thing that I mentioned yesterday is the, the, um, the doctrine of progressive revelation. A revelation of truth out of Scripture has come in steps along the way. And so when you're in the Old Testament various places, you have to figure out what did those people know? Where were they in the whole scheme of things? Was the law given to the people yet? If the law wasn't given to the people yet, well, then they didn't know about the law yet. You know, they had a conscience, but they didn't know about the law yet. It, it wouldn't have known who the Messiah was going to be if you asked them. And so you've got to figure out where, where, where are you in the progressive revelation. And certainly Old Testament and New Testament is a pretty dramatic cutoff. But there's places in the Old Testament as well where you know, covenants are made and covenants end and different things. And so you gotta, you gotta, that's sort of the major question. And hopefully most of you know the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. OK, next. At what point? Oh, I just said this. At what point in the progress of revelation of the Old Testament or New Testament does this passage occur? That's what I was just talking about. Okay. There are obviously different theologians that believe different things. Uh, there's different kinds of covenant theologians. Um, I think the reformers tended to be, I think, tended to be the kind of covenant theologians that only believed in like three, two or three covenants. Covenant of law, the covenant of grace were the main two. And then some of them admit that there's sort of a, I forget what they call it, but it's kind of the covenant that existed with, between God and Jesus from eternity past or something. I'm not talking about those kind of covenant theologians. I'm talking about covenant theologians who actually look at the covenants in the Bible that God made with people. And, and so they, but then they, so that's them. 
And then dispensationalists, another group where they, they believe and that the, you know, the history has been broken up into ages or dispensations. And they name them different things. The age of innocence before the fall, the age of, age of conscience from the fall to the flood, etc., etc. And they tend to kind of line up in general with the covenants that are in the Old Testament and the New Testament. But either way you look at it, both sides agree that there are different chunks of time where sort of different rules apply, different sort of administrative rules that God has put in place. You know, the obvious being the old covenant versus the new covenant, but that kind of idea. And so you, gotta, you have to know, you know, where are you in there? Which covenants have been made? Which ones are in force? What are the conditions of the covenant? And all of those kinds of things. Those are the kind of questions that you ask as you're trying to figure out the, where you are in the progressive revelation. Okay, what's the all, overall purpose of the book containing the text? Of course, the, the example we most often give is the book of John because it has such a clear purpose statement written in John 20, 30, and 31. Therefore, many other signs Jesus also performed in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book, but these have been written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. That's about as clear a purpose statement as you're going to get from any Bible book that's in the uh, Bible. I guess it wouldn't be a Bible book if it wasn't in the Bible. Um, okay, so the purpose of John's pretty clear. Other books don't state a purpose, and you have to sort of read the book and discern what the purpose is. And, you know, now you're getting into things where there's there maybe disagreement between people and what the purpose is, but you got to try to read the book and figure it out. Um, and, and then when you're looking at a text, you try to figure out, okay, how does this text fit within the purpose that the author had? Some books have multiple purposes. So those are the kind of things you have to try to ask these kinds of questions. Because you might get an idea, well, he, he probably meant this when you read it, and then you find out it doesn't fit within the purpose at all. And then, so it, it would at least make you question, am I figuring out the right thing here? And so it's a good question to ask. How does your pericope, the part that you're reading, fit into the thought structure and the outline of the book that it is in? Again, it, it means knowing the purpose. Um, Technically, I, I hate outlining, but and I haven't I have to admit I haven't really ever done it much of the scriptures that I'm looking at. But it's a good idea to try to out to try to lay it out and outline what's going on, so you can try to see where you fit. It's more of a, visu a visual look at where the thought structure is going. So then you look at how what your the text that you're looking at, where does it fit in there? Where does it fit in the thought structure? Um, good question to ask. Um, Okay, the example. Here's an easy example. We've talked about this a lot. Ephesians kind of has a clear thought structure. The first three chapters are the theology of salvation and God's blessings on us. It's all the things God has done for us. It's the kind of thing that just gives you goosebumps when you read the first three chapters of Ephesians because God has blessed us so much. And then Ephesians 4 to 6 are the application part. Okay, start, 4 starts out with, you know, I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the, uh, I'm not going to get this exactly right, but by the mercies of God, that you walk worthy of the calling with which you've been called. And then it goes into all of the different applications of the fact that because God has done all this for you, this is how you ought to live. So they're pretty, pretty different thought structures. Well, are you in chapters 1 to 3 or 4 to 6? I mean, you got to know that and know what the thought structure is of that chunk. And this is the kind of thing that you'd want to look at trying to do in whatever book you're reading is try to figure it out, are there major chunks? Um, Isaiah tends, the first 39 chapters, tend to be a lot of gloom and doom and, and prophecy of judgment and all this. And then in 40, it tends to switch to, appears to be switching to talking to people that are in exile. Okay, th this was written before they went into exile. But the 40 through 66 is more of a, Here's the hope that you're still going to have, even though you're going to be in exile. It's one of the reasons why liberal theologians say, well, it's written by two different people, because the thought structure changes drastically from uh, 1 to 39 and 40 to 66. Well, the thought structure changed drastically there, too. And guess what? The author had the idea that he wanted to change, that God wanted him to change the thought structure. So why can't that be the same person? Well, it is. But 
Okay, so it's the same kind of thing. Um, how does what you're looking at fit? And then the, 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 the pericope or the chunk of scripture you're looking at, how does the one right before and right after you're doing? You know, we're starting to get narrow it down and get a little closer. What's the more near-term context here? Um, and we'll look at, at one a little bit later when we're talking about parables. Sometimes the parables um, are, are given, well, they're given for a reason. Many times there's a context that's going on, Jesus is asked a question or something, and then he goes into a parable to answer the question. And then sometimes he tells multiple parables in a row um, in that same occasion, which suggests that perhaps those parables might have similar or the same meanings because they're in the same place, in the same spot. And so it, at least it gives you an idea. Gee, these two might have similar meanings because of where they're located. It's that kind of thing that you're looking for. Uh, and it helps you again try because, you know, the parables aren't, well, nothing is generally real easy to interpret. We said yesterday that one of our presuppositions is that the major doctrines of scripture are clear, major doctrines primarily of salvation, and those things are clear. So that there are some things that are clear in the Bible, but in general, there's a lot of things that take some effort. And uh, so these are just the tools to help you um, help you do this. <clears throat> okay, some, group, some books are very tightly argued. Romans and Hebrews are an example of real tightly argued uh, doctrinal types of books, even though they're epistles. Oops, Proverbs is one that has essentially no logic. It's just a bunch of Proverbs thrown together, and one right after the other can have drastically different meanings. So, I mean, you would, in there, you just got to kind of pull out, uh, I mean, most, um, uh, most versions of Proverbs will put spaces between, you know, if, if the five verses in a row are, have essentially no relation, they'll put a space after each verse, and then sometimes there'll be four, five, six verses that don't have any spaces, and they kind of all go together because they're talking about the same thing, so they try to give you sort of a visual cue as to uh, which ones go together and which ones don't, but in general, you just got a bunch of stuff thrown in there that uh, a lot of them don't relate to one another at all, so you got to kind of do it verse by verse or very small chunks of verses, and um, that's Proverbs. Um, and then the last one, how is your passage structured internally? Is there a natural flow or progression of thought within your pericope? Is there a clear outline? For example, if you're looking at a psalm, does it divide up into stanzas? Genesis 1, of course, has a pattern of the six days of creation. You're just suggesting that there may be patterns of how the, the scripture is put together that may suggest uh, some possible meaning of where it is and what it might mean. Okay. Now, figurative language. Now, you have in your notes, um, I forget, I don't know what page it's on, but it's in the lesson three thing right after where we are, that says figurative language. And I was going to cover this here, but with based for time, I'm not going to. And I just put all the text in here. It's an example of 12 different kinds of figures of speech that are used in the Bible and their definition. Some of them I even tried to put uh, down a suggested pronunciation. I don't use the dictionary way of doing it. I just tried to put down something that might help you pronounce the words. Um, and then some examples from the scripture of how they're used. So this is an exercise left to the reader. Um, if you're going to be working on anything that has figurative language in the Bible, and there's a lot of it, Psalms, all of Psalms, uh, Proverbs, uh, some of the apocalyptic books, Daniel, Revelation, there's lots of figurative language. So knowing the various things, and, and at least remembering that they're on there and then having a sheet to go look them up, that's what I always do because um, I have temporary drain damage a lot. So I, uh, I keep with Okay. All right. So that is our, our lesson three about context as quickly as I could go through. That didn't take quite an hour. I suppose we could take a break and then we're going to deal with lesson four. This, whoops, I like this poster. If you can't read it, it says problems. It has a big iceberg there. It says no matter how great and destructive your problems may seem now, remember you've probably only seen the tip of them. <laughs> 